All right, good morning. Everyone have a good time last night? Thumbs up, thumbs down? Good. Uh, so we're gonna start the morning off with some uh, Broadcom Bluetooth uh, with Yiska and Dennis. I'll leave it to you guys. Yeah, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Dennis and I'm a security analyst at a German company called ENW. Uh, it's located in Heidelberg, and I'm also a former student at the Technical University in Darmstadt, and that's also where I met Jeska and where we basically started this project. Yeah, so I'm Jeska, and I took over the project from Dennis after he finished his thesis, and I'm now also supervising more students who work on this and also do a lot of my own research there. And, well, today we are going to present you the current state of the project, including live demos, unicorns, and rainbows, um, in 42 slides. <laughs> so, the modern Bluetooth stack, it's not really sorted by layers here, because it's hard to make the vulnerabilities by layer. Um, so, the upper one is, of course, the user, the user who is lazy and does not like check the numeric comparison. Um, so, this is something we don't really care about. I mean, if the user is stupid, then the user is stupid. That's hard to fix. Um, then we have the operating system. So there have been the Blueborn attacks, which are like in the upper stacks. Um, and also something is there is a pairing mode that is um, called just works mode, so you need that for your Bluetooth headset, which is not having any input-output capabilities. And older operating systems would simply accept the pairing. Um, newer ones ask you a yes-no question, but actually this could also be a man-in-the-middle attack, um, and there is usually no warning like, by the way, you're in an insecure pairing mode, and this is something the operating system should fix. Um, then the Bluetooth standard, it has like a long history of insecure encryption. Um, so they started that um, in a very old Bluetooth standard uh, where you have the four digit pin and that was shown to be broken already in 2005. You could just like calculate the key within one second. Um, and then um, like the, the Bluetooth SIG group, they thought like, hey, Bluetooth LE, we don't have so much um, like com computer power there, so we um, let's do some easy pairing, and that one is also again not secure, so um, the low energy is also low security. Um, and in the newer ones, they fixed that, but um, they have some elliptic curve Diffie Hellman key exchange there, um, which is secured with a numeric comparison and so on. But um, in a little bit curved exchange, you have a coordinate that is an X and a Y um, coordinate. And the Y component could just be set to zero. Um, and that was an attack that um, was not prevented by the standard. So the standard said you can check if the Y matches the X, but it was not mandatory. Um, and many vendors did not implement this. And well, actually, in my group, we found another tiny thing that we reported. And so my colleague reported that to the Bluetooth SIG, and he called them, and they were like, do you want to become a SIG member? And he was like, no, I just want to report something. Then she was like, use the web form, and the web form basically is, do you want to become a Bluetooth SIG member? No? Um, yeah, maybe at some point in time they will hire a cryptographer. That would be cool. And then there is firmware vulnerability. So uh, one of these we are going to present here. It's only a limited code execution. Um, we have more stuff in the queue that we cannot show yet. So a student of mine really did some awesome work there. Um, and this is hard to fix, so it's something like um, that this, this firmware patches need to be shipped by the operating system vendor. Um, and so for Apple it's pretty good, for Google it's okay, but if you are like on Linux, forget it. Yeah. Um, so if you want a cool Bluetooth testing setup, it's pretty hard. Either you need to get into a connection as an active man in the middle, um, or you need a special testing device that connects to the device under test. And in both cases, you need to re-implement a lot of the Bluetooth standards, so uh, connection establishment or the part that you want to test. And well, the um, Bluetooth standard has like almost 3,000 pages now. Some people say it's like easier to implement in religion than Bluetooth. Um, 
and you would really not want to do this on a software defined radio. It's just, it's not fun. So what we do in our group a lot is uh, binary patching and a colleague of mine, Matthias Schulz, already did that for Wi-Fi a lot and um, has a project there called Nexmon. And we thought it would be cool to do this for Bluetooth because there's less Bluetooth testing tools than Wi-Fi testing. Um, and in your device, there's already the lower layers. But for Bluetooth, it's very different. So the, uh, the layer three of Bluetooth, so to say, uh, is not um, directly sent on layer one and two but um, it's abstracted. So it's um, very hard to um, access layer one and two despite they are available in your device. And what we do with this work is making those lower layers one and two accessible on off-the-shelf devices like on your smartphone, on your Raspberry Pi, uh, on your laptop, and then uh, do tests with this. And you don't need to re-implement the whole standard. It's already implemented and well-tested you patch just this one function that you want to test. Yeah, and basically this project is called Internal Blue. Um, I started by reversing the firmware of this smartphone. So this has a Broadcom Bluetooth controller. And um, yeah, that's basically where I started. Um, I found a way to dump the firmware and uh, throw it into a disassembler. And after a while, I like, discovered many features that Broadcom implemented. Uh, one of those was a feature for them to ship patches to the firmware, and once I understood how that worked, I was able to basically patch the firmware myself. So um, basically, this is how it works. Um, we have a protocol called HCI. That's the host controller interface, and basically, in the Bluetooth protocol stack, it's the protocol that connects your operating system with the Bluetooth controller. And Broadcom implemented some vendor-specific uh, HCI. Is the mic still working? Maybe put it on the table or something. I already got it here. Mm. <laughs> um, or should we use the other one? Oh. <laughs> OK. Good. Um, it's better? I will do a demo later, so I'll just uh, keep it in here. Is that okay? Cool. Yeah, so basically there are those um, vendor-specific HCI commands that Broadcom implemented, and they allow us to access the address space of the chip directly. So um, what I did with that is dump the firmware and then dig through it. And uh, once I found out how this patching mechanism works, I was able to modify the firmware, at least temporarily, until the next reboot. And so this is how they ship uh, security patches and also new features sometimes. So um, I then developed a framework, like a Python framework, to basically do that, uh, which also has an interactive shell so that I could uh, experiment more easily with that and started to like, think of what interesting things we could do with that. Um, one of those things, uh, and probably the first thing I did, was implementing a so-called monitoring mode uh, for the lower layers of the Bluetooth protocol stack. In this case, um, for the LMP protocol, that's the link manager protocol. Uh, I will explain this in a second. So usually you don't see that uh, if you open Wireshark and sniff on Bluetooth because this is handled completely inside your Bluetooth controller and does not ever reach the, the host system. And uh, it's still a pretty interesting protocol. It does pairing, uh, like the, the key exchange during the pairing and all this kind of stuff. So it's interesting to actually experiment with that. And now with those patches, we can actually monitor them in Wireshark and also inject arbitrary packets. And once you're able to do that, you can do more things. So um, the next thing I wanted to do was implement like a proof of concept for this fixed coordinate invalid curve attack that I uh, just got mentioned. And um, basically, I just uh, patched the firmware of my Nexus 5 to simulate such an attacker um, so that if I would pair it with another smartphone, I would see if the other smartphone is actually vulnerable or not which is pretty handy uh, also for my day-to-day -day life as a pen tester. Um, so this is already something where this becomes very useful. 
And then eventually also we found bugs ourselves in the firmware. Of course, if you dig a lot through uh, the firmware of another device, you will eventually find bugs. And uh, Yiska, for example, found a crash you can trigger remotely and unauthenticated. And in some cases, for some devices, this also gives you limited code execution, but more on that later. So this is how the Bluetooth stack looks like in an abstract way uh, without all the application layer protocols. So some of those application layer protocols you might know is OBEX, RFCOM, and like all the audio protocols. We are not interested in those. We look at the lower layers. So everything basically below this layer two cap protocol which is like the TCP of Bluetooth. So layer two cap does uh, connection multiplexing and everything below is like interacting with the Bluetooth controller. So we have this host controller interface, um, which I already mentioned, where we found those vendor specific um, HCI commands of Broadcom. And um, yeah, basically this works like this. The host is telling the controller what to do with HCI commands. The controller then does all the stuff it has to do and it reports back to the host with HCI events. And um, then inside the controller, there are a whole bunch of other protocols that don't ever reach the host. So for example, there's this link manager protocol. Um, it's called LMP. And this is terminated here, like on this layer, and will not get transported over to the host. And it's responsible for setting up and managing connections with other remote devices. So for example, pairing, uh, all the encryption, um, also managing this frequency hopping, and so on. It's all done on this protocol layer. Now, um, I already mentioned we implemented internal blue as a Python framework. So it's actually running on my host system here. And uh, now you might wonder how we are able to communicate with a Bluetooth chip that's inside uh, the phone. And this is where uh, like the Android Bluetooth stack comes in handy because it has some debugging functionalities you can enable during compile time. And then it will expose to TCP ports on localhost, which enable you to basically inject HDI traffic into this connection between the host and the controller and also to monitor this traffic. So we basically just connect the phone via USB, forward those two TCP ports to our host system, and then internal blue can directly communicate over HCI with the controller. And um, yeah, I'll later also demo that. But first, let's give a quick overview what else we can do with internal blue. So we started on Android with the setup I just showed you. Um, but uh, in the meantime, we also implemented support for Linux directly. So it's possible now to just take a Bluetooth dongle which has a Broadcom chip, put it in your Linux uh, laptop, for example, and we then will just use HCI sockets uh, from the kernel to communicate with this chip. Um, also, yesterday, we pushed to GitHub um, the support for iOS. So another student actually implemented something similar like we do in Android for iOS. So on a jailbroken device, it's now also possible to do that on iPhones. And macOS support is still work in pro uh, progress. Um, now, the, um, the Broadcom Bluetooth chips are actually be found in many different devices. I started working on the Nexus 5, which contains a BCM4339. And this chip is also be found in many other de uh, devices like the Xperia one and some Samsung. Um, this is the best supported so far because I um, like um, the forest with uh, the reverse engineering and also the patching. Um, but there are other chips that are partially supported. Also, for example, in the Raspberry Pi, we have Broadcom Bluetooth chips. So the Raspberry Pi 3, 3 Plus, and 4 um, all are supported. Um, then we have uh, evaluation boards from Cypress, where we also found symbols. This is something Yiska will tell more about uh, just in a second. So. There's also very interesting to do reverse engineering because we know the function names. And I'm currently working on support for so uh, small USB dongles you can buy for like 10 bucks, uh, which often also uh, contain Broadcom chips. And this would be then a very cheap platform to do this kind of research, um, but still work in progress. So I guess uh, we will do a quick demo of the tool and then continue with the reverse engineering part. Well, if you don't want your uh, Bluetooth device to be shown here, you should switch your Bluetooth off. Um, so maybe otherwise your MAC address might appear. 
Um, so can we have this in-screen set up with cool. the... Yeah. Yes, okay. So this is currently the Nexus 5, which is connected to my uh, laptop. And um, yeah, this all works while the device is actually running. So you could also run an app that is using Bluetooth and, and then we can interact directly with the firmware while actually Bluetooth is still working for the app. So what I will do now is uh, start internal blue. It will give me a list of devices that I have currently attached to my laptop. Um, so it detected that uh, we have uh, a Nexus 5 over ADB and also my internal uh, Bluetooth card uh, over HDI. So um, once I select the device, it will start to communicate with the device over HCI and first uh, grab the current version of the firmware. So through this, we can actually see if it's actually a Broadcom chip and also get the exact firmware version and then load um, like every information we have on this uh, particular firmware. So some of the features might only be available um, on some chips because we have reverse engineering information on them, like uh, symbols and offsets, and on other chips, some features might not work. But on the Nexus 5, we have almost all of them. So then there are uh, all kinds of commands you could do now. As I said already, we have complete access to the address space of the chip. So I can just uh, like start dumping memory directly from the chip. It's uh, Cortex M3, so um, the, the ROM is actually mapped at address zero. Um, so what you can see here is basically the interrupt vector table of this chip. And this is also where I start reversing and uh, found out what everything is working. Um, the other interesting feature is this monitoring mode. So if I start this, it will basically just start a Wireshark instance and connect it to this um, like uh, HCI flow which we already have for the phone. And it will also activate a diagnostic mode so that the LMP traffic is also forwarded to us. Um, so you can actually see HCI traffic, which is nothing special. You could also see that with just uh, putting a phone into a debug mode and like it's called BT Snoop Block. Some of you might uh, know that. Um, but now we shall also be possible to see LMP packets if we, for example, try connecting to another device. You will see that here um, LMP traffic is coming up. And um, yeah, maybe you have never seen LMP traffic before. It's pretty interesting what's going on on this layer. For example, we have uh, name resolution on this layer. So let's just see. Um, yeah. Uh, usually, your phone, if you put it into a discoverable mode, it will just broadcast its address. And once you know the address of any other phone, you can just connect to it um, over this LMP layer and ask it for its name. And this is also what your phone is doing when you like look for other devices. You will first see all the addresses, and then your phone will sequentially uh, connect to all of the devices in the surrounding and get its name. And this is happening before any authentication. The, the user will not notice that this is happening in the background. And also, there are other interesting things going on here. For example, those packets are um, within the uh, simple pairing procedure. So this is actually now part of the Diffie-Hellman key that is just exchanged uh, for these two devices. Um, we uh, have aborted the pairing, but the, the keys uh, exchanged uh, anyhow. So yeah, I hope you can see that this is pretty interesting things to experiment on. We can also now inject those packets and through patches also like change how the phone behaves during this pairing sequence. And yeah, this is pretty cool for doing security research. Now, other things we can do is like interact with our firmware directly. So for example, I can also just disassemble functions. We already know where they are. So obviously, this is better in an interactive disassembler. But maybe if you're just debugging some patches, this might help. So this, for example, is now the function that is responsible when receiving LMP packets. And another feature I want to showcase with this function is trace points. So we had a lack of a debugger here. Um, that would have been awesome to be able to set breakpoints and stuff. Uh, but because the chip is running in the phone, we have no way to debug it like this. Um, so what we do is we just um, have a feature called trace points where if I add a trace point, it behaves a little bit like a breakpoint. It will just insert a hook at the address I tell it, and the hook will basically then, once the, the code reaches, as 
well, the code flow reaches there, we'll just uh, dump all the register values and the RAM and send it over the HCI socket to our host. Yeah. So here you see I inserted a, uh, a trace point and once an LMP packet is received, it will just say, okay, uh, we just hit this uh, particular trace point and here are all the register values. Uh, we also have a run dump now captured in a file and you could put that file in your IDA database and then see what is the current state uh, of the firmware. So it's a little bit like debugging but without actually breakpoint. Um, okay, I think that's it for the first demo. Let's just continue with uh, the actual reverse engineering work. Yeah, so actually last year, um, last year's recon was when Dennis almost had finished his thesis and I was starting to take over the project. And so he had already spent like months of looking into assembly and I started looking into assembly um, and just wondering. Um, so if there would be some time travel, I could have told me like there is more than 11,000 function names, 4,000 hardware register names, almost 3,000 global object names. And well, I didn't have any symbols back then. So um, what I just did was like staring at the code and also then I did a lot of staring on the code. And we gave the function some names, like there is some pointer to some struct that handles connections or um, there is an LMP buffer that in the end will somehow be sent or there is like just some vendor specific HCI command and it is like super, super strange. Um, and that was like the state of how we did it. Um, I mean, I will later tell you how we found the symbols, but um, actually it was pretty accurate what we did. So I was surprised when I had symbols in the end, how, how good the names that we had were. Um, so we will now tell you how we did it without symbols, because it might just be interesting for any kind of project. Yeah, so because this was actually my first major reverse engineering project, there were definitely a lot of things I learned during the process and some of them I uh, wanted to share because um, yeah, I made those mistakes and maybe some of you will not make it if I tell you. So what I should have done, uh, I should have put more effort into online research before I started. Um, like it's not that I did not look online for everything I found in the firmware, so strings, uh, specific values, and some things you find, but I didn't find anything like really meaningful for me. So I thought, okay, I have to really reverse engineer it at all, and I have an example on the next slide that I was wrong. Um, then another thing is uh, for this kind of project where you have um, like different devices running a slightly different firmware, but probably um, having the same core and core functionality, it makes a lot of sense to look at all of them in parallel. Um, this is a mistake I made. I focused on the Nexus 5 and what I should have done is I should have researched which other devices have Broadcom chips inside and I should have um, yeah, looked at the firmware of those other chips as well, like new firmware, older firmware. This also makes sense and I have another example for that uh, just on the next slide. Um, other things I actually did quite well, I guess. For example, um, I, um, from the first time on, I dumped not only the ROM, but also the RAM and other things of the firmware um, I could uh, dump. And I put that all into IDA, and this helps a lot if you have actually like the structures and all the data inside the RAM uh, when you reverse engineer all the functions that are actually working on those data structures. So uh, we did multiple run dumps at different states, like during pairing, after pairing, uh, once the phone is connected, when we send specific patterns to the phone, and you can find that in the RAM and then do cross-referencing and uh, find interesting parts of the firmware. And then the last thing is um, definitely use the standard. So even though it's almost 3,000 pages long, it uh, contains a lot of valuable information and um, it's free for download, so you can just download the PDF and I think after one or two days you find the interesting stuff and where it's all, like where the, the HCI and LMP protocols are actually defined, all the upcodes and packet lengths, which you can then find also inside the firmware and also, for example, the, the secure simple pairing mode has a state machine that is accurately described in the standard and once you found the, the state machine in the firmware, you can maybe just apply all the information from the standard to your database. So here's uh, the example where I actually should have done more uh, online research. Um, this is uh, part of the RAM when I first looked at it and you might also uh, notice those weird four-letter strings. 
Um, I wondered back then what they would mean, but I had no clue. Um, once I did more progress with reverse engineering, I found out, okay, uh, it seems like they're always at the start of structures in the run, at certain structures. So it seems like some magic values, um, yeah, marking some structures. And um, yeah, later I found out, um, look at them in little engine and it makes more sense. Um, then it looks like abbreviations for like block memory, queues, threads, semaphores. And that was awesome because now I had all the data structures from the real-time OS um, that is running there. And uh, I could start reverse engineering much more efficiently with this knowledge. Um, and I also put those terms into Google, but I didn't find anything online. So I thought, OK, just Broadcom proprietary stuff. Uh, I will reverse engineer it. Um, later, we actually found out this is not something that Broadcom developed. It's uh, a real-time operating system called ThreadX. And um, it even has some leaked source code online. So I found out if I would have just put that as a hex value uh, in Google, I would have found the leaked source code. And this would have saved me two months of reverse engineering work. <laughs> yes. Um, how I actually found out about this is I dumped the firmware of those uh, little USB dongles you can find, which also contains old Broadcom chips. And in the older firmware, there's actually more copyright strings left. And so in this firmware, there was a copyright string of uh, Express Logic, which is the company behind ThreadX. And uh, yeah, so I found out about this real-time OS, which is actually quite popular. So you might have also come across devices which contains this real-time OS. It's not only used in Bluetooth controllers. It's also used in, for example, printers, industrial devices, and also the Deep Impact Space Probe from NASA. So it's quite funny. Yeah, now let's do um, the time travel in the opposite direction. So last year, December, I got, um, so we submitted a paper and it got rejected and the reviewer said, yeah, it's just an Nexus 5 and it's old and please show us it works on the newest device. And the problem with the newest device is like, I need to convince my boss to um, buy the newest smartphone without even knowing if it has a Broadcom chip, and then I need to root it without breaking, and then I need to extract the firmware if it is a Broadcom firmware, so it's like quite a lot of money investment just for maybe it has the correct chip, and maybe I'm able to extract it. Um, and then I found out, well, there is um, also evaluation boards. So um, I bought an evaluation board, and this one is just like $50. Um, and so I just wanted to get that one to check if, um, if Broadcom still uses the same mechanisms over HCI to, to patch stuff in there. And then um, it took me just three days, so from expecting nothing until I found out, oh, it has like all the symbols. So on those evaluation boards, you have like the thread number eight, so it, you have usually seven threads, and the eighth thread is an IoT application that runs inside this. Um, just share it with everything. And for, for the Wi-Fi, they have just like 10 symbols or something defined uh, that you need for interaction. But for uh, Bluetooth, they have like thousands of symbols left in a patch.elf. And you can just use all of them um, and interact with that. And even better, so in their, um, in their toolbox, they forgot symbols of the MacBook Pro 2015-2016. So now we just do not even have the symbols for some evaluation boards, but for real hardware. And that's also cool. If you, if you find something now, we can like make bug reports and say a bug in the function name this and that. Um, it's much better. And reverse engineering with symbols really is fun. So we now know like at least so we have a thread create function. We also know like the special registers, like it's a blue RF read and not just like some strange mem copy. Um, and we found that there is a diagnostic mode. So actually um, we can not only look, uh, lock LMP traffic, but also LCP traffic. And that's already in the firmware um, and in all firmware. So not just the Nexus 5. Um, we can send LMP packets and also, we have uh, the vendor-specific stuff that is there. So for LMP, they have a special BPCS protocol. Um, and they have weird function names like handle super duper peak poke. I don't know. I mean, maybe that was like um, a function named by ABBA. I don't know. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, so now let's go to the binary patching. Because now that we have the, the symbols, it would also be cool to, to change the firmware. And I mean, we already did that before with some, some uh, assembly and stuff, but it would be nice to do this with C and all the function names that we have. Um, and basically, we already had this Wi-Fi project. And so our current work in project um, is to port this to the Bluetooth. So in Wi-Fi, um, that's what I now tell you. So I tell you just like two slides how we do it in Wi-Fi, and then I make uh, the changes for uh, what is uh, needed for Bluetooth. So in Wi-Fi, uh, we can actually write a complete firmware, um, and there might be an interesting function that you want to look into, and there are like branch or branch link, so it's ARM, so you have just branch and branch link. And then you look for all those branches and branch links that you are interested in, um, then you make hooks, so you say like uh, a BL patch or a B patch uh, for the function, and then you jump into, uh, you override the branches with those hooks and jump into your own new function that might also eventually call the original function, so you might just like put some debug output and then call the original function anyway. Um, and so the, the problem here is like if you have something like you want to hook into all mem copies, that would be really a lot of patches. Um, but we could do that on, in Wi-Fi because um, we patch the complete firmware. So the complete firmware is in the operating system and during initialization it's loaded. Um, but the problem also is that um, you have the same chip, the same Wi-Fi chip, but depending on the operating system that you use, you might have a different firmware version in it. Um, so you need to research where the symbols are even within the same chip for the different firmware versions of it. Um, one cool thing is that there is a source code leak that you can, can Google for. So there is one version of the Wi-Fi where we have C code, um, also um, with comments and stuff, so that's pretty nice. But it's very hard to find this again in a specific um, Wi-Fi firmware on the, so to, just to check like at which uh, address is now this thing located, the source codes, where did it get compiled is very hard. Um, and so the word is a bit different for Bluetooth. So in Bluetooth, the firmware is in a ROM. So first of all, that means that all, um, so if you have one chip, no matter which operating system you have, it will always be the same firmware in the ROM. And the way they patch it is that they have some hooks. So they have like 128 hooks um, that are temporarily um, in a so-called patch RAM. And each hook is four bytes, so you can just like put a branch or branch link patch in it. And that's the way how also Broadcom is patching those devices. So they can enroll up to 128 patches um, in one device. And so uh, for the firmware where we have the leaked symbols, it's pretty easy to now enroll those patches. Um, and that, that's what we use. And expect from that we can um, use the, the next month project as for Wi-Fi, but we need to take care of reducing the amount of uh, branch link and branch patches. So I will now have two examples. The first one is more like a toy example, and the second one is um, an attack example. Um, so first, for the toy example, um, in the Bluetooth standard, it says if you are pairing with a device that has no input and no output capabilities, like a headset, um, there cannot be a man-in-the-middle prote protection because you don't have like any factor, any trusted thing between those two devices that you could compare. You don't have certificates and stuff. Um, so you need to rely on there is currently no active man in the middle nearby. And the question is, so the standard actually says like how you implement this in the operating system, like if you show a warning or if you show the user just like do a pairing, yes, no, it's just up to the um, vendor how to implement it, how to display it to the user. And we wanted just to test like how do others other devices behave if I pair, so I'm a smartphone, but I'm a smartphone without input-output capabilities. Is there a warning, yes or no? Um, so what we do, there is um, 
an event handler. So the event handler is SP for simple pairing um, event handler. And now I could just like go into this all those case statements here and check like all the event states and change it. But I just decided so there is one global variable for the state of my input output capabilities. And just before entering the state machine, I just um, set this um, variable to I have no input, no output. Um, if I do this, I have a branch patch because I don't want to mess up with the uh, existing registers and stuff. So I just do a branch uh, patch here, no branch link. Um, and then I go into my new uh, function. This branch patch will uh, mess up with the first four bytes, so that's why it's marked in red. Then I need to restore the first four bytes currently as inline assembly, so that's one of the reasons why it's currently work in progress. That's a thing that I want to automate. Then I define the I.O. capabilities, at which variable they are, where in memory, that's again device specific, um, assign the 0x03, which means no input, no output, and then I branch back. So it works, but it's not really cool. I mean, I, I'm still like writing um, a lot of inline assembly, um, but just as a toy example, it works. Um, and you can build it. There is two ways to build it. Either you can build it as a uh, .hcd patch, and this one you could push onto your smartphone, or you can just make a Python patch for internal blue, and this one will only be temporarily, and in this case you want it as a Python patch because you just want to change it like once or twice for some pairings, but not as a permanent patch in your operating system. And the result will be a patch ROM with some whatever uh, hexadecimal stuff. So that's actually just this branch patch. And the second write mem, again, all um, assembly that is this IO capabilities assignment. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that's it already. Um, it works. Still does not look like very nice, but with the source code, uh, you have an idea of what is going on. Um, so, now let's think a bit further. So, uh, let's assume we would have arbitrary code execution over the air. Um, so, that's not the part that is like here in the talk, we just have limited code execution. But let's say we have arbitrary code execution over the air. What could we do um, just within the standard? So, this is not about escalating through something like through vulnerabilities within the Android or Apple whatever stack, but um, this is about doing something that is compliant to the standard and that will always work. Um, so actually, um, this Broadcom controller has no possibility to store keys over time. So as soon as you reset it, um, all the temporary patches are gone and the ROM is really a ROM, so it's not writable. Um, and the way to store keys that you have established with devices during pairing is that the host will take care of this and save it. So every time you do a pairing or you do a, a connection establishment, you need to check like, do I have a key or not? And if you already have a key, you don't need a pairing, you just need the key. So you say, I'm pairing now with this, this and that MAC address. Oh, do you already have a key? Yes, I have a key. And then the host will give you this key. So you can request keys, just um, specified in the standard. Um, which means that as an attacker, we can actually extract keys from the host if we know the MAC address. Um, so first of all, we have a, a file called wrapper.c um, in that you need to put all the um, functions that you want to use inside your C code so that you can re uh, write a bit more readable code. Um, so that's the functions that you need for our example here. So just allocate HCI uh, events, send them. Um, and one thing that is interesting here is that we use a different uh, possibility to install a patch RAM entry, so this ROM patches, this temporary ones, but uh, I will go into this later. Um, so there is um, a function which is called uh, from the host when it is reporting a key. So this is the step two of this. So I'm not requesting the key, but this is the key reply. And normally um, the um, 
reply will only be parsed if I already have a connection. But I'm not really interested in having a connection, so I don't want the key for something I have a connection to. I just want the key and put it somewhere. Um, and the somewhere I decided to be the device name because then I don't need to implement any further packet sending and stuff. So I just like put the key, copy it to the device name, and override the device name. So that's not like super stealthy, but it's like a short, um, a short implementation. So I do a patch here. Um, and in this case, I'm not doing it with a B patch or BL patch because I have like a payload that I want to send over the air, which is then installing this patch entry. Um, so I use this uh, internal function of the firmware to install a patch entry. Um, and then I call a new function, which is basically a lot of restoring the original functionality again, plus uh, copying the link key to the device local name. Um, so that's it for this patch. And then I need um, a second patch with that I actually request a key. And keep in mind, only when um, the host has a key, it will reply with a key, otherwise it won't reply. So you will only trigger this uh, exploit from the previous slide as soon as there is a report for a key. Um, and we can request a key as follows. So we just like uh, allocate some event buffer, uh, put our MAC address there so it's reversed by order. So we just like request for one, two, three, four, five, six um, as a Bluetooth address. Uh, and send it as an HCI event, and as soon as there actually is a key that gets reported, I would change the device name. Um, so that first of all means that even if like the host has no vulnerable implementation or something, um, you can exfiltrate all link keys. Um, and um, I mean, currently I'm not doing it like very stealthy, but you could also do it in a more stealthy way um, that um, is not observable by the user. So if you have Bluetooth enabled quite often and if you travel around um, and maybe you also don't have like the most current operating system patches, then it really might be that there is some uh, remote code execution in your Bluetooth chip and that someone could run this. So just like while you have your headset on at the airport, do a last call before uh, entering the airplane, um, that might be a thing. Uh, so don't trust any pairing. I mean, really don't trust any pairing. Um, Android has some functionality to add a trusted Bluetooth device that you can use to unlock your phone. Just don't use this. Um, so, okay, now um, we, we had this deep dive into how to do some patching if there would be something vulnerable, but we didn't tell anything about vulnerabilities yet. Um, so, how to actually search for vulnerabilities? So, yeah, let's find bugs and Bluetooth lower layers. Um, so, Bluetooth lower layers are, uh, like, not well tested. Um, and if I know the MAC address of someone, I can just like connect and moreover, I can request um, the LMP version, which is the same as the firmware version usually. So what I have here is like an iPhone 5S and that one would just like tell you, oh, I'm running uh, Bluetooth 4.1 and oh, my minor version is 0x2203 and then you would know which exploits you can run on this. So uh, the patching is very dependent on the locations in, in the ROM of the firmware, but actually the phone tells you the ROM version it is running, so you can prepare your exploit. Um, one thing I just stumbled uh, across during testing is that when you have a secure, simple pairing, um, and you initiate this with the victim, the victim does not even like respond to this pairing, um, and you request for uh, LMP start encryption to start the encryption, but you do not yet have a key exchanged, then the firmware will just crash. So that's a simple thing, so it's just like a crash um, that is not really exploitable, but uh, still something. Um, but cooler is if you have like some execution. Um, so in the beginning, I said like we did a lot of reversing of functions and we compared stuff to the standard. And what you do there is you go through all kinds of handlers, check opcodes, um, and compare opcodes to the standard. And then there was this one function, this one LMP handler, 
which was not specified in the standard, so it was just like LMP opcode zero, zero is not defined, um, and they had their um, uh, Broadcom proprietary, I don't know what CS is, but it's like a special um, protocol there. Um, and so I just found out I can crash other devices with this, but actually crashes are, are the best case. So the compiler is usually putting similar stuff one to next other, and so what happens there is that after the LMP handler table, there's usually other handler tables. For the Nexus 5, it's HCI handler tables. On other firmwares, it's other handler tables, sometimes also HCI. Um, so it really depends a lot on the firmware you are running this exploit. Um, and on the Nexus 5, we did not find arbitrary code execution, but we still found very funny stuff. So one of the HCI commands that you can call is um, the enable device under test mode. And that means usually the test mode is something that you only should enable like while you are on the device over HCI and not over the air. So HCI can never, triggered, uh, can never be triggered over the air. Um, but here we can do that. Um, and that's pretty cool. So I can just like tell the other device, oh, let's, can you go into device under test mode? Could you just please stay on this one frequency and like send something? And then the device would be like, jamming its own uh, frequency where it might also be running Wi-Fi, for example. Um, or you could just like draw the battery empty or what, whatever you want. Um, and we tested that it also works on other devices with the same Bluetooth chip. Um, so uh, it's a nice attack just to show that we can execute HCI commands over the air. Yeah, and now um, to finish this, I have a live demo. The thing is, so the most critical part of my live demo is actually to establish a pairing um, initially. <laughs> I mean, you know, Bluetooth, Bluetooth is uh, always buggy. So let's see. I mean, you can also already go into the... Um, Console page. Uh, let's see. Yeah. So that's really annoying. This part here. Maybe I just like pause the music for a second. Um, so um, Dennis already has opened the exploit that he's now going to load. Um, so. Um, with this one, we are overwriting the LMP uh, checks during sending, so we want to send arbitrary LMP payload and we don't want it to be validated, so this is basically what it does here in the exploit, plus we load this into um, the connection function, so he the only thing he needs to do is like a connect, so up on the connection establishment, he will crash the Bluetooth um, connection I have with the other device. Um, so, first load it. So he's loading this now onto the smartphone. So this is also how you could use internal blue, not in the interactive mode, but just as a Python module uh, to write your own scripts. So this now has installed two patches, uh, which basically, as Jeska already said, uh, changes how this device behaves when connecting to other devices, and basically it will now deliver the exploit during connection. So what we do now is I continue with playing the music, and once the music plays, uh, Dennis will do the connection establishment, which will then crash the connection the two here have. So, do you hear the music? So. It's gone. <laughs> so, I'm gonna try this Bluetooth mm -hmm. Mm, so let's see, uh, the thing is, so Bluetooth will restart at some point in time, and I don't know like when it does this. It says no nearby Bluetooth devices found. I'm not sure if it's like, ah yes, now it's turning off. Yeah, so the thing is that it takes a while until the operating system realizes the Bluetooth driver is like no longer responding, um, but yeah, so that was also, that was still the same crash. Okay. 
Now you cannot, uh, yeah, you can again reinitialize, but it, it like takes like half a minute or a minute if you don't have traffic going on until the host will realize that it's gone. Yeah. So um, we are now open for some Q and A if you have questions, um, and there's also a lot of tools available online if you want to play around with this. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, there is a question. Over there. Does anyone have? Uh, Test. It's normally Kale's job. <laughs> Where is he? There, 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 there. If I cannot answer the question, the unicorn will. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, thanks very much for your talk. It's really interesting. Um, I was just wondering, how did you initially go about identifying the vendor-specific HCI command that allowed you to dump the ROM? Uh, basically, um, I stumbled over it when I was looking for the, uh, like, uh, there's a data sheet for this uh, chip, and um, I initially got some leak of the firmware uh, through another way. There was uh, some other app that could already uh, somehow deliver patches to it, and uh, through that I got initially the firmware, but then when I looked into the data sheet, I found that um, they mentioned this Petra mechanism, and they also have like really a specification for those vendor-specific uh, commands. So um, yeah, you can just uh, search for the data sheet for those Broadcom chips, and uh, usually you will find uh, how those vendor-specific commands work. Any more questions? Uh, uh, yeah, there? yeah, yeah. Thank you for your talk. That was interesting. I have a question about other potential issues you've caused just by stuff from the standard. Do you have any other ideas, any things you thought through that you didn't present? Like, you mean vulnerabilities as defined in the standard, or...? Uh, sorry, um... So, I mean, there's, like, kind of two types of vulnerabilities, like the ones in the standard versus the ones in the implementation? Yes, per the standard, something that would work across all. You did this sort of a thought experiment, what you could do if you could have arbitrary remote code execution, and something that would work on all devices. Are there any other bleeds that you have there? Um, so far not. I mean, like, for the key extraction, I don't know. It's, it's pretty hard. I mean, I, I did not look so much into that so far. Um, so we are more into the firmware itself and into implementations on the host. Okay, yeah, what that makes what sense. I currently looking at is how the, the Bluetooth stacks on the different operating systems interact with the, the Broadcom chips or uh, with all Bluetooth controllers. And uh, what I have seen is that, for example, in Android, that there's uh, open source Bluetooth stack, so I could look through the source code. And it seems like that um, at many places, we're, or the, the Bluetooth stack is actually trusting that the, the firmware is uh, according to the, the specification. So I would guess that um, if we now fuss the Bluetooth stack from a perspective of the Bluetooth controller, like uh, through the HCI interface, um, there might be some vulnerabilities in the implementation because um, yeah, the, the Bluetooth stack is actually trusting the firmware, but it's yeah, not exactly uh, like issues with the specification directly. Uh, uh, yeah, you mentioned that they often don't quite follow the spec. <laughs> yeah. Got it. Thank you. Uh, thank you again for the talk. Uh, do these exploits apply to both Bluetooth Classic and Bluetooth LE with these parts? Ah, so the one exploit that we were showing, it's LMP, so that's Bluetooth Classic. Um, other stuff that is in the queue is affecting other parts of, of the standard, yeah. So it depends. But this uh, connection stuff, it's all LMP, it's all Bluetooth Classic.
No more questions? Uh, oh, one. one more. Hi, guys. Uh, are you aware of any formal methods used in you know, proving specific uh, properties for, for the implementation, implementation, you know, implementing the standard? That's really hard. I mean, it's like 3,000 pages, and you have like all the stuff that you want uh, be to be in there, like length fields and yeah. variable stuff. So I'm not sure if you can prove it's secure. It's more like you can show that there's tons of stuff that you would never like to be in a secure protocol. Yeah, it, it'll be it will be very small properties that you can you can try. I, I'm not aware of any. I'm just asking. If you know, it, it would be crazy. I agree. But I mean, the Bluetooth stick that just like screwed up basic encryption. So why should they start proving protocol states and handlers? True. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>